Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to World History. Today we're going to look at our story, we're going to continue our story of the transatlantic uh, reconnections known as the Columbian Exchange by describing the process of the conquest of Central America. And so we're going to introduce you to the Aztecs and then unfortunately bring them to their end. So let's dive in and discuss. Here are your basic objectives for today, and let's dive into our story. The Aztec Empire was a continuation of the previous Mesoamerican empires, and so a lot of the components of your Olmec and your Maya society continued in Aztec society, despite, of, of, despite the fact that they were, of course, separate groups of Native Americans. But they had a similar, somewhat cultural heritage. The Aztecs were a relatively large empire that developed over time sort of in the central area of what central basin area of what is today Mexico and their capital was based or the Mexico City was eventually built on their modern day capital. So that's where they are sort of geographically within the region. As you can see expanded over time uh, Moctezuma the first was probably the most important and most powerful emperor of the Aztecs. Although Moctezuma the second who was the last empire of the Aztecs as you can see did add some significant territory here down in the southeast. So the Aztec religion was central to their society. They used, uh, they were a somewhat paganistic society with a bunch of different gods and goddesses representing different natural forces. In Aztec religion, human sacrifice was central. They would have extensive ceremonies by which uh, the prisoners were brought up these big pyramids, these ziggurats, and then they would be ritually sacrificed by priests, chopping into their, chopping into their chest, ripping out their heart, and then burning it. As you can see here, uh, the sacrifice is, of course, designed to you know, change the course of Aztec civilization. And so when uh, things were going poorly for the Aztecs, they would step up the sacrifices here, quote, the sacrifices began at midday and ended at nightfall. 2,300 men were killed, and their blood bathed the entire temple and stairway. Each time the priest cut out a heart, the body, they rolled the body down the stairs. So, the Aztecs got this stream of sacrifices through their conquering of tributary peoples. These were other Native American societies that were conquered by the Aztecs and were expected to provide products to the Aztecs, both, you know, whatever kind of crafts they had, some measure of food and crops, and then, of course, people to be sacrificed in the Aztec ceremonies. As you might imagine, this did not add to the cohesion of the overall Aztec empire, as many of these tributary peoples felt very little connection to the Aztecs and saw them as nothing more than hated conquerors as opposed to sort of benevolent rulers. So, not a lot of good feelings in the Aztec empire towards the ruling Aztec peoples. The Aztecs developed sophisticated use uh, technology as far as production, their production of agriculture. They were most famous for the Chiapas, the floating gardens that were situated around their capital city, which we'll get into in a little bit. Irrigation is, of course, absolutely necessary for the Aztecs as the southern Mexican sort of plateau basin area is relatively arid and dry. And so having access to water is necessary for crops. The Aztecs grew uh, a very variation of the Three Sisters. And, as we can see here, there, there were floating islands approximately 17 feet long and 100, and, and, uh, and 100 to 300 feet wide that rested in reed frames and were anchored to the bottoms of the lake. Willow trees were planted to provide shade, and 20,000 acres of Chiapas were constructed around the Aztec capital, and the yield of them, and because of this, the growing, because of the access to water, the growing season was long, and the Aztecs could harvest oftentimes four crops a year. And so their food supply was absolutely, their food supply was protected. Aztec culture was to some degree, they continued and modified. Mayan and Olmec, uh, both uh, societal pieces, uh, uh, art styles, uh, they had a similar form of writing. And they brought in the Mesoamerican ball game, which was popular in both of the other civilizations. This Aztec version was played with a leather ball, and the goal was to hit, with the, hit the leather ball with your elbows or your shoulders and get it through a hoop, a large stone hoop placed up relatively high on a wall. Uh, oftentimes, uh, at the end of this game, the competitors were sacrificed, and so this, the game was both an, an element of Aztec society and culture as well as an element of their religion. The, capital, the Aztec's capital city was probably their crowning jewel. This is the city of Tenochtitlan, or Tenochtitlan. It was built on an island and then sort of modified with massive causeways connecting the island to the mainland. 
Floating gardens would then be around the outskirts of it, and so it became a fortified fortress if you were ever to siege it. If, uh, if an enemy army would surround the Aztec capital, they could simply pull up the causeways, defend the city, and they would have an almost unlimited food supply with their, agri- with their fields floating around the city, untouched as, the enemy, as their enemies would have to try to scrounge for food in the somewhat unhospitable climate around the city. And so the Aztec capital being unassailable, they were able to build a relatively large empire due to military conquest and organization as well as as sophisticated central planning and uh, the con- uh, political system that controlled the various tribes that they took over. Economically, they had a vast trade network. Uh, they brought in, they had massive markets within their capital city where oftentimes hundreds of thousands of people would come to trade and buy products. The Aztec capital at this time was larger than any city in Europe, and they had, they had a spectacular planning and order. In the end, there was an audience house, as it said, where magistrates sat to uh, decide controversies and to solve any problems regarding uh, any of these groups of people. And you could. And and, uh, then they'd have, uh, again, they'd have judges in order to resolve conflicts and to ensure that society functions smoothly. In the end, the guy who was the doom of this powerful Aztec civilization was Hernán Cortés. Cortes was a noble, a younger noble of a Spanish son, and he set out to go try to find his wealth in the New World. Under the Spanish program of the Quinto Real, he would be promised four-fifths of everything that he conquered, and so he recruited a group of Spaniards willing to go off with him with the promises of wealth and power if they managed to find and take some from Native Americans. The established government of Spain refused to help him. He was actually declared an outlaw by the governor by the governor of Cuba, Diego Velazquez. But he set off with about 300 men anyway, made contact with Native American tribes on the Yucatan, was able to recruit a local who was a whiz at languages named Malinche to translate for him. And he just, as he talked to these other Aztec groups, he found out that, uh, honestly, they didn't like the Aztecs particularly much, and that uh, he might be able to get some Native Americans to help him in a rebellion if uh, he was able to start one. And so he saw this as a way to potentially create chaos and make wealth for himself, and so he set off to find the central Aztec territories. Once he arrived in Tenochtitlan, he was able to make contact with the Aztecs, Moctezuma, the king of the Aztecs, did not immediately put him to death because of a convenient prophecy where they predicted that the god Quetzalcoatl would return at about this time. And so Moctezuma wanted to talk to Cortes and find out, is he the god Quetzalcoatl? Does he know the god Quetzalcoatl? Who is this strange guy with this advanced technology that's showing up randomly on our shores? dressed differently, riding animals that the Aztecs had never seen before. The Aztecs were particularly awed by Spanish horses, as we talked about in the Americas, when we studied the Americas. Large domesticated animals had dry, had died out in the Americas significantly before civilization developed. And so the Aztecs had never seen a human riding an animal, especially not covered in armor. Aztec technology also wowed, also wowed Moctezuma, as we can see here. He, uh, as the description says, when the gun discharged, something like a round pebble came forth from within, fire went showering forth, and when it struck a mountain, it was as if it was destroyed. So, obviously, this advanced technology could have seemed like magic to the Aztecs, and if nothing else, Moctezuma wanted to figure out what the heck was going on with Cortez. Quote, then there came to be prevalent a great sickness, a plague. It, was, it originated in a city, and there it spread over the people a great destruction of men. There was much perishing, like a covering were the pustules. Indeed, many people died of them, and just as many died of hunger. There was death from hunger, and there was no one to take care of another. There was no one to attend to another. And so, with the Spanish came the brutal diseases of smallpox and measles, which further destabilized Aztec society. When Cortes got to the city, he grabbed Moctezuma and held him hostage. He then demanded that the Aztecs provide him with wealth, gold, all of these other things. He hung out in the Aztec city for several weeks, continuing to demand tribute from the Aztecs and from their tributary peoples, until an incident happened and Moctezuma was somehow killed. We're not sure if he was killed by the Spanish or killed by the Aztecs, but either way, at this point, the Spanish were in trouble. In what's called uh, Cortez's account is that the Aztecs were planning on killing him, which admittedly, if I was the Aztecs, probably. But he used this as, as an excuse 
for his behavior. He fought his way out of the city, and then he was able to recruit a bunch of native allies and return. When the Aztecs and their native allies returned, they were able to, quote, drive the people out of the city in many directions. Some 5,000 of Native Americans were, and uh, 5,400 Native Americans were assisting him, and he was able to more or less drive the Aztecs out of their city. Here we see several accounts of the fighting, both Cortez's fighting to escape the Aztec city, and then, of course, their return and the subsequent destruction of Aztec society. So just like that, with a lightning bolt of a combination of technology, luck, and disease, the, this mighty Native American empire is toppled, and it creates a massive power vacuum in Central America. This power vacuum would then be filled by the Spanish, allowing them to take over the top rung of Aztec society, and more or less simply demand that the different groups that paid tribute to the Aztecs pay tribute to them. This system is going to be slightly modified, but it's going to become the basic structure of the Spanish empire going forward. So that's the story of what, why the Aztecs were relevant and how they fell from power. Next time, we'll move down to South America and tell a shockingly similar story about the destruction of the great Inca Empire. But for now, here's your closing objectives. Hopefully you can answer these in some detail, and thank you for listening.